Clifford had easily pinpointed their location due to the exceptionally strong spiritual energy emanating from the writer. He pondered why the gods had chosen him with such an intense energy source. What was their plan? As he was sure he could use such energy to his advantage, he had completely forgotten about dealing with the noisy children once he sensed the writer's energy. Hastily, Clifford had left the house and hailed a taxi. With a casual gesture, he flung open the car's rear door and slid inside. The cab driver, irritated by Clifford's abruptness, responded with rudeness in pidgin English, asking where in town he wanted to go and how much he was willing to pay. Without hesitation, Clifford seized the driver by the collar, swinging him around. The man gazed into Clifford's eyes, where he saw black smoke billowing. Just drive and don't utter a word, Clifford ordered, before releasing the man. The car revved to life and sped off, directed by Gaul, who guided the driver based on his sense of the energy. When they arrived at the Grand Mansion in Asokoro, Clifford issued a stern warning to the terrified driver about the dire consequences of leaving without his permission. Clifford felt Gaul's delight as he disembarked from the cab. Finally, they were close to capturing the writer and forcing him to reveal the medallion's whereabouts. However, the sight of the monk gave Gaul pause. This was one of the monks who had ensured his imprisonment through their purity. The monk's soul emitted a bright light a purity that repelled darkness. Yet, there was the writer, emanating an abnormal surge of energy. Something was amiss, Gaul sensed. The gods were scheming something, and he couldn't proceed without more energy, derived from the evil and malevolence found in the hearts of men. Once he unleashed his powers from the medallion, he'd be free of these inhibiting factors. Gaul decided to postpone confronting the writer. He wasn't afraid of the monk, but he knew he wouldn't achieve much without a significant power boost. He needed the evil within the hearts of men to flourish. When the time was right, he would strike. Now where to? The merchant. Clifford remembered the man was supposed to give him some millions for stealing the medallion. He decided to spend the night at the white man's place here in Asokoro. After collecting his due, perhaps he would indulge in some entertainment, knowing the writer was within his grasp. Inspector Lucky and Rotimi closely trailed the driver to a guest house thoughtfully arranged by the chief in Maitama, a secure and upscale district of Abuja. They collectively decided that Saint should take the opportunity to rest, allowing himself some respite from the mounting tension. In contrast, Odian was inclined to spend the entire night in deep meditation, searching for answers or guidance amid the turmoil. Lucky, Though somewhat skeptical about its effectiveness, initially favored having a significant security presence around the guest house. He wrestled with the daunting question of whether even 10,000 policemen could safeguard Saint and his companions from the looming threats of Ghoul and Clifford. Odian, on the other hand, strongly advocated against maintaining a formidable security contingent. He cautioned that their lives would be perilously hanging in the balance if Gaul chose to make an appearance. Despite his reservations, Lucky ultimately decided to station four discreet policemen to discreetly keep watch over the visitors, ensuring they remained unobtrusive and did not directly intervene unless absolutely necessary. With the departure of the inspector and his journalist comrade, Odeon retreated to a designated room, requesting unwavering solitude and privacy, regardless of the circumstances. Janet and Saint had a room to themselves, a luxurious yet unsettling sanctuary. The awareness of police presence in the vicinity offered little comfort. In the dimly lit room, Janet initiated a conversation, inquiring about Odeon's unusual demeanor earlier, a reference to his mysterious aura of calm and authority. Saint, having shed his shirt, sprawled on the ample bed, illuminated only by the soft glow of the room's ambient lighting. His mind, however, wandered far from the plush surroundings. He pondered the enigma of Odeon's existence and the perplexing question of why the gods had allowed Gaul to become aware of him. As Janet emerged from a refreshing shower, she joined Saint on the inviting bed. 
their discussion shifted towards the weighty decision to come to this secluded haven, a decision driven by necessity and fate rather than desire. Janet confessed the deep fear that had gripped her upon witnessing the gruesome aftermath of Clifford's visit. Together, they contemplated the reasons behind Gaul's intrusion into the chief's residence, speculating about the intended target of his sinister presence. Saint, bare-chested and contemplative, expressed his earnest hope that no further harm would befall innocent lives. He ruminated on the chief's involvement in this unfolding drama, concerned about the role destiny had thrust upon him. Janet, nestling closer to Saint, laid her head gently on his bare chest, seeking solace in his embrace. Words eluded her, but her physical presence was a source of comfort and strength. Saint, his thoughts dominated by the grim realities they faced, yearned for clarity and a sense of purpose in these troubling times. Saint's lamentation persisted, his heart heavy with the injustice and malevolence he had witnessed. He voiced his concerns about the lurking threat of Gaul and whether their refuge in the guest house would remain undisturbed. Janet, trembling slightly with fear, sought reassurance from the man she had come to rely on. In response, Saint held her close, cherishing the warmth and reassurance of her presence in this time of uncertainty. Inspector Lucky's immediate destination, after leaving Rotimi at his office, was the police station. They had arranged to meet again the following day. The urgency of the case was pressing on him like a weight, and he knew there was no time to waste. While on his way, he received a call from the Commissioner of Police for the FCT, who was anxious for an update on the baffling investigation that had gripped the region. With a firm tone, Lucky assured his superior, we are on top of the situation, sir. The case has taken a diabolical and supernatural turn, but we are committed to resolving it. The commissioner, clearly concerned, tasked Lucky with doing everything within his power to apprehend the killer and to thoroughly investigate the hospital incident earlier in the day. He urged Lucky to seek assistance if required and concluded by demanding a comprehensive report on the case by the following day. Upon reaching the Lugba headquarters station, Lucky was met with a sense of urgency. Officers were busy preparing for an impending raid. Audu had been keeping him informed about their plans, but Lucky insisted on personally leading the operation. Once inside his office, Audu wasted no time updating Lucky on recent developments, including the interrogation with Bola that had unveiled the identity of the kidnapper. Lucky couldn't help but remark on the eerie accuracy of Saint's mentions in his writings. The writer was definitely on point when he mentioned all these names, Lucky reflected. But right now, he says he has no idea what to write next. He's trying to make it all sound like a coincidence, not a premonition. Abdul chimed in with the suggestion that the monk might hold answers to their questions. Lucky acknowledged the possibility, but couldn't shake the eerie feeling he had about the unfolding events. He marveled at the monk's apparent purity and the fear it had instilled in Clifford. The weight of the case was taking its toll on Lucky. The inexplicable and supernatural nature of the crimes, combined with the enigmatic monk and saint's cryptic writings, had left him deeply perplexed. The imminent raid on James's location was their next move, but it felt like stepping into the unknown once again. Audu shifted the conversation away from the eerie topic of Gaul, wanting to focus on their immediate tasks. He brought up the possibility that Akine might actually be the chief's son, a notion that had been lingering since they read the story. However, Chief had kept this suspicion to himself, not wanting to spread the news without concrete confirmation and perhaps to protect his daughter from any distressing revelations. Lucky nodded in agreement, stressing the need to retrieve the medallion. Audu assured him that preparation for the raid was in order. James was a well-known figure in the area, influential and deeply involved in illegal activities. Many top police officers in Abuja were aware of him, but no one had ever dared to question the source of his wealth. He was also rumored to handle shady deals for government officials. With determination, Lucky stated, we have to apprehend him before he slips through our fingers. He's already killed a policeman and he may possess the medallion. 
He might consider himself untouchable, but he won't escape this time. The two officers left the office and headed for Bwari Area Council, accompanied by a squad of police personnel. Upon their arrival at the police headquarters there, they secured additional backup for the impending raid. Lucky couldn't help but ponder James's seemingly careless involvement in the kidnapping, despite the high likelihood of an investigation leading to him. The thought crossed his mind that perhaps the gods were orchestrating events to distance the medallion from Gaul. However, he found himself surprised by his own thoughts, feeling like he was delving into superstitious territory. Upon reaching the fenced building believed to be James's residence, Inspector Lucky and his team proceeded with utmost caution as they entered the house. What they found inside was both eerie and perplexing. The building was devoid of any furniture, just plastic chairs, empty bottles of hot drinks, and lots of cigarette butts.